Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, After Dark Edition, double header. I've just had dinner after I uploaded the YouTube video of the Vuelta Espana stage today, so you know, podcasting with with indigestion. That's just a that's just a hazard I'm willing to work through. Um, no days off. Hashtag grind set, etc. Anyway, this is Grand Prix Cycliste de Quebec, Francophone region of Canada. Therefore, the French teams and French riders or Walloons in particular, they get a big performance boost in this region. That's scientific. Last year won by Benoit Cosnefroy in a flyer. It's a punchy circuit. He went on the... Which one did he go on, Benji? Because there's two... The Côte de Glacis is kind of double-stepped, right, in this circuit. Exactly. It's kind of double-stepped, and I think last year he went on the second aspect of it, the second portion of it, so closer to the finish line, roughly 2.7-ish kilometers to go. Would he go on that portion again? Who knows? The other portion is like a kilometer earlier. So there's kind of like a, a descent in between the two portions of the climb. But anyway, that's kind of what it looks like. It's 16 bloody laps in this parkour. So it's all in kind of the same circuit, which I'm not the biggest fan of circuit races, but I do like Quebec when it comes to the parkour. I like because these two races. You kind of see like, I don't know, it's also at the perfect time for your, your Europeans to watch the race. because like good, in our yeah. evening podcast kind of late, I reckon, but... <laughs> We'll work as late as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> Your midnight snack podcast yeah. back in the day. So anyway. this is the easier one. This is the one that sprinters, a uh, uh, really versatile sprinter, can win. For reference, Mo the the Montreal Classic is much more difficult. Pagacha won that last year, over four thousand meters elevation in that one. The favorite for this race was Christophe Laporte. You know, Yamo Visma had to send him because he's a francophone. Wal Penard actually not allowed to participate. Um, because he's nah, fuck it. That joke doesn't work. Because he he won it last. Did he win it last year? No, he came. No, he was close, relatively. Yeah. Anyway, he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, he was the favourite. Got Hater here making a return to competition. I'd be interested to see how he goes. Schilmers is on a on a burner. Ala Philippe, you know, could he do anything? He or she, Adam Yates, he's done every race in the world. Wellens, UAE, always strong. Uh, De Lee, could he? Win his first world tour level race, Morich. It's a they're really good start list. I'm telling you for these um, Canadian classics, Michael Matthews who always does well at these. Yeah, but because the world championships is now earlier, I reckon there's more people that are not informed than usual. Because otherwise, this was a build up race to worlds, no? Because now yes. it's kind of a a build up race to European champs. You're right. When the fuck is that? I don't even know. Soon, I think. <laughs> it's at a certain point. That's for certain. I'm not but sure what right. point it is. That's why, aren't we always saying, well, Luke, is that we need to move Paris Bay to uh, autumn? To which date? I don't know. Halloween. End of September, yeah, start of October. <laughs> and in the dark. Because yeah. now we, we've gotten used to it at the Vuelta, so might as well have Roubaix in the dark. Anyway, this race started, and we had a breakaway. Matthias Vacek. Mauri van Sevenant, Gianmarco Garofoli, and David Lozano. But let's be honest about it. This break ain't gonna do shit. Four riders in the breakaway, that's not gonna make it until the finish line. And this was an odd kind of chase in the a peloton behind, actually, because this is not just one team taking it up. It's kind of all the teams that are not in the breakaway that do believe they have some chance of winning that are like, we might as well put a guy at the front. And we saw that circulating team by team. And one of the teams that was very active, in my opinion, was Tudor. They've got uh, Alexander Kamp here, and they were at the front quite a bit from like the 50 kilometer mark to like the, the 40 kilometer mark. And going into these last four um, climbs, the last four glassy climbs, that's where the action would start happening because the break was kind of getting caught at that point. So, break was caught before the fourth last climb, 40 kilometers to go. Hater at the back of the peloton in his natural habitat. And we see our first moves on that, on that climb. The fourth last glacis. Attacks by Masnada, Barancini, Derek G, Harper, but it's kind of those attacks where it's kind of like a break formation because they're all trying to get like a second breakaway going after the first one was called, like a group that can kind of ride away and maybe benefit. But because they all do that, they neutralize each other. And by the time they get over the top, there's a team that says, let's just control the tempo and, and keep it together for a bit. And Trek did that in this lap. And the next lap we had Masnada doing the exact same thing with Touch from the Sun in the wheel. And, and then in the the second last one, things started changing up because then you've got certain teams that move their riders forward and one of the riders moving forward was Ethan Hatron. 
Do you still have the same take on even haters' behavior at the back of the peloton than trying to move up last minute? Um, yeah, it's, I don't know what, what's going on. They, it's something they need to think about in the off season and, and work on. It's obviously like no one else. Maybe sometimes you need a game changer to change up cycling and look at things differently. I don't think this is one of those things. I think, I don't think it's optimal what he's doing. So, um, if he wants to be in the classics, you just can't do it. Maybe on yeah. a circuit like this, you can try. But if you do this in Kerno or Omlope, yeah. even those you, you, you're done. You can't move up. I reckon the kind of system that happened in this race, the fact that it's always on the climbs that people attack, kind of helps with that because you can kind of sit at the back in between and then try and move up by the time the climb hits and try and benefit that way. So I guess it can help on this kind of race, but whether it would actually help Adrian, who knows, because we saw a move on that second last glossy climb, the second last round, basically, which was Ben Healy doing Sid. And he was kind of attacking kind of doing his healy pacing thing at the front of the group and it actually made the peloton kind of thin out and it, this race is kind of an attrition race every lap people drop every lap people drop and that's why a lot of riders finish this race dnf basically and when healy made it to the top of the climb mcnulty countered over him and that thinned the group again but no separation we get that same exact behavior we saw in in the fourth last lap fourth last lap track took over after the climb and set a controlling pace now was Jayco doing that with the likes of Harper and so forth, probably for Michael Matthews in the group. But we're getting towards the last climb, and this is where actual stuff will happen. This is where we're expecting a big move by someone or people trying to survive to get to the final sprint, right? And we see Micah setting this tempo, probably for Tim Wellens and Hirschi in the group. And then the other leadouts come around. Six kilometers to go, two kilometers towards the final climb. We see... Lotto coming up on the left side of the road. If we look at the peloton from the front, they're right there. Groupama in the middle. So Lotto was for the Lee. Groupama was for Valentin Madua. And then on the right side, we've got Alpesin with Hermans and Ajazer tries to come around with the Wolf and Kosnefa. But Kosnefa was in second wheel and the Wolf in third wheel. And that was a bit odd, but they switched around swiftly before they got to the glossy climb. And then Kosnefa was in last wheel. And would he attack on the first portion of the climb or the second portion of the climb? What did he do, my friend? I didn't really know which exact portion of the climb it looked. To be honest, I thought when I, when I turned it on yeah. and he attacked, I thought I had accidentally put on last year's edition. <laughs> like, seriously, I, I had to check. It looks so similar. <laughs> like, he's gone in the same place. They've telegraphed it. And there's nothing anyone else can do. It, it's not like people... When he had that initial snap, Kosnifra, the gap he gets is so big. And the problem for him is there is that second part that kicks up and he completely dies there. So he had to go, you've got to hold it for 3Ks. Not all of it's flat. You've got to go up the second part of the Glass C. And there's teams chasing because it's not thinned out that much. And yeah. for reference, a lot of the teams are here uh, and sending the, you're like, these are big names, as we already said, maybe not in the best of form, but... There's big UCI points here. These two races are very, very important for teams, particularly like did UAE they, looking to maintain their lead on Yumbo. Did they change the points? As in, in the past, it was the same value as Milano San Remo, but I reckon that switched now, or is it still the same? So, so the monuments got bumped up to 800. Yeah. These stayed the same, actually. You still get 500 UCI points if you win, Ooh. 400 if you come second. And if I check... What's a, uh, a big race? The Giro d'Italia, for example. Let me just sing. Pretty big we... race. Fifth in, so you, the same as fifth in the Giro is, five, is 495 points. Sixth is 415. So second here is the same as sixth in the Giro. So, and there's yeah. two of these races this weekend. So it's, yeah, there's big points on offer here. Uh, anyway. I feel like when it comes yes. to Cosmo if I vividly remember last year's edition that he went earlier this time, Somehow in my head, he went on the second portion of that climb last year. I'm not sure about that, but feels like that in my head. And like you said it, yes, there are strong people here. There are strong teams here that are trying to kind of get shit together after that move by Cosnerfa. Jayco, for example, were chasing for Matthews. Yeah, but it's also the fact that other punchers that didn't go on the first portion of the climb will try and do it on the second portion now. And that's what Paulus did. While Jayco did kind of the valley in between the first and the second portion of the glossy climb, Paulus was the one that did the real move on that second last, uh, on, that, on that actual last pinch point, that last part of the glossy climb. And he does that move and he basically closes Cosnefa. 
with everybody in the wheel. Hirschi Mud was in the wheel, and then the group kind of came back, and we get this run into the sprint now, because it's two and a half, two kilometers to go, and I feel like I saw Laporte on the left side, a rider of Jumbo with him, a third rider a bit further. I expected them to be the team that would be doing lead out. The lead was in Narnia, the Shadow Realm, so I was like, he's probably not winning this. Like, yeah, go on. <laughs> there's almost no one that can win in that position. Who That's how I feel. Who is the lotto guy that jumped up almost level with Laporte or Benoit that was chasing Cosnefra? Was it the Lee? Because there's a lotto rider when Cosnefra jumped, you see him overhead. But where Van Hills would make more sense. I think it was Van Hills, but I'm not certain. Um, so yeah, you, you kind of said it. That lotto rider tried to move backwards a bit, tried to get to the Lee that was in the Shadow Realm. But I'm looking at the front of the race. I'm expecting Yumbo now to move forward, and they do that. They've got Sam Allman, Tish Benoit, and Matthew. Uh, no, not Matthew, Laporte, as their, as their actual sprinter. Now, Allman and Benoit are not exactly the best leadouts in the world, but this is slightly uphill towards the sprint. Yeah. So it, it probably kind of helps that you have Benoit, but it's probably still not the best rider to have as a leadout in the world. That being said, I was like, if Laporte's in good condition, this is a really good leadout. This is a position you can sprint form. Aram Budu was there. Corbin Strong was there. And I was looking at that side of the road for the victory, eh? And yeah, well, yeah. And on the other side of the road, at least 12 wheels back. In the wind, one man was bringing him forward, was Arno Dali. And pretty much as Benoit's doing his lead out, Dali starts to wind it up from 12 bike lengths behind Laporte. Laporte starts to sprint. Goes nowhere. He's like, he just didn't have it. Uh, he's or immediately swamped by Matthews. Aaron Brew and Strong was very, uh, very strong. Pardon the pun. <laughs> and nominative determinism. <laughs> there you go for Corbin Strong. Perfect finish for him too. And maybe the Pro Conti teams wanting points really have their good riders targeting these races because they are huge points and it's not San Remo with Matthew Vanderpool targeting it. And so he's going, he looks... Corbin Strong looks like he has it wrapped up. Yeah. He's got Matthews a bike length back. He's got Aaron Baru a bike length back. Um, and Morich isn't going to come out of those guys' wheel. And then Arno Dali, I thought he would sit down at some point. This is one of the most impressive sprints this season. I was like, he has to sit down at some point. Sprints on the hoods, out of the saddle, I don't know, for over 30 seconds. And beats Strong by, I th nearly, he nearly put him on a second. He, like, puts yep. him on two bike lengths. Crazy sprint from, um, what's his nickname? Not it, Le Toro, the bull? Yeah, Toro. That, that's his nickname, I, if I recall correctly. <laughs> this, was, this was, again, nominative determinism befitting that nickname. Wins his first World Tour race. Huge win against good competition. Yes, it's not a Cobble Classic, but still, I, I rate these races. 500 UCI points for Lotto Destiny 2. Thank you very much. That goes into the uh, the coffers for the, the promotion in 2026. Yeah. yeah, huge result for him and the team. And the thing is, like, most riders in that position would give up. Caleb Yoon in that position in any sprint, 100% gives up. Sits up, doesn't care about the rest of the victory anymore. It's, it's done. But it's been multiple times now, and I feel like it's kind of an evolution that he's gone through in the sense that he's often had to sprint from a shit position to the point that he kind of had to try and make it happen from those positions a lot of the time. And this was like the extreme version of that. The position he was in, I did not believe he would be able to do that. But it is truly impressive. And you said it, this is one of the most impressive sprints of the year. I'd rate it as the most impressive one I've seen, with the second one probably being the Magnus Court one, in that one stage where he was in the break win, then in the last corner decided to sprint again. That stage was, was pretty amazing. and. This, this beat is that for me, because this was really bloody impressive. And he probably suffered on the climbs. Laporte had nothing in him, to be honest, after the climbs. Like, his lead-out was done by Benoit, and he kind of just waltzes backwards. And really impressive by Corbin Strong, to be honest. Like, it's kind of a baby Michael Matthews at the moment. Like, he's the young version of Michael Matthews in the sense that he can also climb very well. He can get over climbs. He Don't has that sprint it. at the end. Don't say it. It's now a Corbin Strong stage. No, no, no. I thought you were going to say he's from the same country, but... Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to, because you're listing things that are all similar. I was like, he's going to say Mate, it. you've called Danny Van Poppel Belgian 70 times, so I, I can yes, say man. strong is. Okay, if, 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 if Dutch people, listen, Luke, I know you're listening, because <laughs> you literally produced, if Dutch people didn't want me to confuse 
JMP Druka, Lou Verkin, and Bob Jungels were Dutch people. They make the flag more different. Druka too... is not even Belgian nor Dutch. He's Luxembourg. No, no, sorry. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> but I'm just going back to my Luxembourg thing because I confused Luxembourgs <laughs> for Dutch people yesterday. I just skipped your thing. Why is the flag so similar? You can't have two countries next to each other, pretty much, with the similar flag. It's not right. Fuck, I just realized Australia and New Zealand basically have the same flag except for the colors of the stars. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm playing myself here. I'm just saying the tour of Southland is better than the Santa Stood and Under. That's just bait. <laughs> no, 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 that's facts. Fourth Grand Tour. New Zealand, New Zealand Cycle Classic. Is that like the first UCI race of the calendar year normally? No, 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 no. I ask Corbin Strong. He'll agree. It's, it's in like, it's the first race, but it's in November. <laughs> It's like the one, this, or the gravel and tar classic goat race. Isn't, isn't Tour of Southland the, the tour where they all kind of dress up as animals? Where, <laughs> what? like, yeah, the teams no. have, have kits in animal kit. There was a snake kit. I think this is the, what you do on, on your Kiwi weekend. Team. No, 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 no. I promise you. I promise you. Tour of Southland. <laughs> Google it. Google it. Kit, snake, or something. This sounds like, like a Kurt Mess in, the, in Kreuzberg in Berlin gone wrong I after dark. I am telling you, this is something. <laughs> Lawrence Pithy, Lawrence Pithy, Ali Wollaston, Corbin Strong, please confirm whether this is true or not. I know you're listening. They will confirm. I've had <laughs> conversations with them about it. All right. <laughs> anyway, Delee wins. Strong second. Two pro Conti teams, one and two, uh, but they're racing like World Tour teams a lot this year. Matthews in third. Aaron, uh, they need the points too, Jaco. Aaron Baru, he's back. Benji in fourth. Morich fifth. Laporte sixth. Maybe a little bit disappointed with that sprint. Camp 7th for Tudor. He is she 8th. I was impressed by him. He looks a bit strange in the Swiss National Champs jersey. Alaphilippe 9th. Shkiel Moza 10th. Did you know, Benji? What? Mark Ishii has more UCI points this year than he ever has had in his career. He's having a career year. I did not know that. The only thing I know is that the chat is now calling me a furry, so yeah, <laughs> that yeah, escalated yeah. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was the Grand... <laughs> Pre-Cyclist de Quebec Classic. Uh, we'll do a little preview now of the Montreal race, just so you know, it's it's in two days. It's a little bit more different. Like, it, it does look the same, but it's more difficult. The climb, the Côte de Camillion Oud is 2.3K, 6.2%. It's got an 11% 300-meter kicker in there. It is much harder, 227Ks. It is up and down. And there's also two climbs that just aren't named in this course as well. Uh, not... An uphill finish, though, on that climb. It, it is sort of a little uphill drag where Poggy just torched everybody uh, last year. This is one for the more pure punchers. Like, Laporte is not getting around this, but I think he's on... No, he might not be on... I don't think he'll be on the start list. There's no confirmed start list yet for half the teams. It's probably going to be similar riders, though, because you won't send a completely different team yeah, to, to like... Canada. 16 riders to Canada for two races. Yeah, You'll like just send eight or domestic. 10. Yeah, I reckon Tish Benoit and something will, will be leader there, riders like that. So I don't think he's going to achieve much at Montreal because the competition's pretty big. Like, I expect Skelmos to do well. Adam Yates did pretty well last time, so I expect him to compete if he's still in okay form. McNulty might actually compete as well. Tim Wellens, also a name for that race. So. I think UAE will dominate this race. Like, here she looks hmm. good. Here she well as Yates, McNulty, man. They can play numbers. They can go along with McNulty, who won for Nardesh last year. They want the points. So they're, they're going to be motivated for it. They're gonna, I think they're going to go really well. Healy? I like that as well. Healy on a fly. Skelmosa. You know, didn't he... he what, what did he do in Liège 9th? Flesh 2nd. Amstel 8th. You know, pretty serious Arden rider. Same with uh, your man Maxim van Hills who did very, very well break out our den season. So it's maybe we, I'd love to see those guys sort of do well. I'd love to see Paulus and um, Schmidt. Sh is it too hard for Schmidt? Didn't he get closed last year? And that's why we selected him for Worlds? Yeah, him stupid? and Bagioli, right? We're, we're really Sixth. good in this. And Bagioli was Bagioli. third. Yeah. Yeah. Who, I'm going to go with, Mark Hirschi to win. You're going to go with Mark Hirschi to win? I'm going to go with... I completely forgot who's at this race, even though I just went through the start list. I'm going to go for Skjelmose, because why not? Yeah, he's been in good form the whole year. Sort of a breakout season for him as well. 
But yeah, that was our wrap up of the Grand Prix Cyclist Quebec. We've got uh, Montreal when's that Benji Sunday? I think so. I think we'll be <laughs> I'll be able to watch more of that one. Uh, and I really yeah. like the climbing one a lot as well. Uh, so I'll watch more of that one. Maybe we'll do a double header, no promises though, because um, we are quickly running out of steam. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this impromptu after dark recap. Any oh, you, you look like you want to say something, Benji? I'm gonna go to bed. Really? It's early for you. I'm so fucking tired, man. I gotta walk my dog. I gotta some feral. Let's say about the feral cats. So there's a oh. second colony of feral cats, right? And the, one of the kittens has grown up a little bit, and I'm trying to yeah. tame it. Uh, my hands are just. It's hacked my hands to bits. Um. At the moment. Is it the hand with the broken finger? Yeah, well, you see, when, when I was in Xavier two years ago, <laughs> uh, a pit bull attacked me. And it grows every time I tell the story. It gains 10 kilos, this pit bull. <laughs> How big was the pit bull? At least 80 kilograms. But I'm just built different. Anyway, <laughs> I just realized the NFL's on Sunday as well. And I'm watching Red Zone. I ain't watching Montreal. Like, no fucking way. <laughs> so you and Luke can do it. What? Your, I'm May, NFL, real sport. Get out of here. Sorry, the entire chat should NFL be NFL Red Zone you now. is the best entertainment product in the world. And the Canadians are putting this race on and they are trying to, they're trying to say something about, you know, the NFL. Um, I don't even know what sport NFL is, so. National football, American football. Wait. Oh, American, NFL, I thought National it was football. hockey. No, that's NHL. <laughs> The Canadians oh, would never Christ. put on. The Canadians would never put on their race clashing with the NHL. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope you enjoy the recap. I will, we will do a Montreal one. Don't worry. I'm just joking. Maybe. Good. Until Sunday. Ciao.